says Jacques Lacan, is that in the end, you don't know whether it's pretense or not. A zone is not entirely a matter of free will. This concept has already beaten down most objects into abject submission. Objects are far more threateningly autonomous and sensually autonomous than the Kantian version of autonomy. Objects are, in a sense, like the temporary autonomous zones celebrated by Hacking Bay. The birth of a fresh object is a political interruption, a revolution that changes all the other objects, no matter how slightly. A zone is not studiously decided upon by an earnest committee before it goes into action. One of the predominant features is that it is already happening. We find ourselves in it all of a sudden in the late afternoon as the shadows lengthen around a city square, giving rise to an uncanny sensation of having been there before. Objects emit zones. Wherever I find myself, a zone is already happening. An autonomous zone, like a pair of carefully tuned sine waves that fills a house with a crisscrossing field of interference patterns. Eliane Radig's astonishingly led ARP synthesizer tones fill a church with resonances whose lowest frequencies are felt physically as much as in the ear. A dissonance at that, that sonic depth results in the body being physically shaken, literalizing what Adorno says about how art shudders and shatters the subject. With their vibrant lines, the paintings of Bridget Riley and the Aboriginal artist Yukulchi Napangati emit zones that grip me in their wake, unleashing powers on my optic nerve as I have um, decided to explore in, in, in several places in my work right now. A human ethical, ethical or political decision is already made in the force fields of intermesh zones. There is no way to find oneself already having achieved a transcendental purchase on the zone. Kantian aesthetic judgment in which I have decided what an object is, what objectness is, before I encounter the object is possible, if at all, only because I have already found myself strafed by the zones that objects emit. The simplest cigarette butt or child running into the street reduces every ethical or political stance to the status of hypocrisy. Nevertheless, it is the hyper-object that forces us to sense this hypocrisy. Hyper-objects are simply so large and so long-lasting that the zones that cascade from them are so rich and intense that it's easy to become aware of them. Now, this is far from saying that we immediately encounter situations in which we know exactly what to do as if everything were mechanically automated. Rather, my sense of distance and irony, my hesitation, becomes more pronounced when I find myself latched onto a zone. It is the ontological priority of the zone that accounts fully for the feeling of strangeness and belatedness in my decisions about the object that emits it. It is just impossible to come up with the right reason for why I put the cigarette out in the sequoia forest. Indeed, if I try to reason, uh, generate a reason, I find myself watching the cigarette burn the undergrowth. I have already made a decision not to put out the cigarette. The zone has already grasped me in its beams. This doesn't mean that I know exactly how to dispose myself relative to the zone. Far from it. It means that I have no idea or that I can feel the irreducible dissonance between my idea and the zone. On what scale am I engaging the zone? Why do I put out the cigarette? Is it because I'm concerned about the environment in general or this tree in particular? This forest? Is it because I understand global warming and I see the cigarette as an indexical sign of human ignorance, a small piece of a gigantic puzzle? Again, the zone is not a region of direct experience, but a shifting, illusory field of irony and weirdness. This is not nature. This is Heidegger's thrownness inverted. I do not find myself any old wear, a projection of my Dasein's unique uncanniness. Everything is doing that. The uncertainty and hesitation are not just in my Dasein, but in the tree, the rock, the cigarette butt glowing in the ferns. My sincerity, my sensitivity to my phenomenological enmeshment in zones is the very thing that prevents me from grasping it as solid <coughs> and predictable. The existence of zones emitted by objects is the physical reason for Kantian beauty. Kantian beauty is a non-conceptual, object-like entity that seems to float between me and the object. Kant reads it as a reflection of my a priori synthetic judgment, but in order for this aesthetic experience to arise, there must be a zone. The zone vibrates from an object and burns through my conceptual overlay, haunting me with its strange strangeness. The zone turns my beliefs and reifications to ash. In the case of hyperobjects, this happens even if I am thick-headedly not well attuned to zones. Hyperobjects are simply too vast to be ignored. Thus, we are no longer forced to choose between a transcendental aesthetics that guarantees the freedom of positing in an act of synthetic judgment, can't, and a substantialist aesthetics that crushes me with the weight of its awesome authority, Burke. The political implications of each aesthetic philosophy are quite evident. We should, without doubt, choose the Kantian option. 
Burke is the aesthetics of the Bush administration and their shock and awe tactics against Baghdad in the Second Iraq War. But now we have a good, realist reason to accept Kantian aesthetic theory, not grounded in some transcendental beyond, but right here, before I think about it, in the zone. The zone is non-conceptual, but not a blank nothing, not a Hegelian A equals A of immediacy. The zone is unspeakable precisely because it is in my face. I don't reach out to touch it, rather the object sends it to me. Zones are real, but they are not objectively there, since that would mean that we have already decided on their existence and are caught in the correlationist circle drawn by and since can't. There are problems with thinking this non-objectification, problems that Heidegger, among others, didn't resolve, yet hyperobjects seem to operate on these conceptual frames quite efficiently. Ontotheology wants to convince me that I must construe things as real by thinking of them as objectively present and there. But the hyperobject prevents me from objectifying it as real in this way. Although it is of course real, without doubt, it seems to assail me like a nightmare or a threatening circus clown. It is never for Hunden, as it's always disappearing behind the rain cloud, the sunburn, the pile of garbage, the feeling of being inside a hyperobject contains a necessary element of unreality, yet this is a symptom of its reality. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Isn't this the maxim of modernity? For 200 years, performing intelligence has been about saying something like, I am smarter than you to the extent that I can see through um, around mere objects or through your naive attitude. Being right, philosophically, has most often been a case of going meta. What does going meta mean? Monty Python's argument sketch almost perfectly embodies it. A man walks into a faceless bureaucratic office building that seems designed to dispense government aid of various kinds. At first he enters a room in which someone hurls insults at him. When he tells the insulter that I came here for an argument, the man apologizes. Oh, I'm sorry, this is abuse. Arguments are next door. <laughs> next door, the man encounters... You have to do a bit of Monty Python. <laughs> next door, the man encounters another bureaucrat who refuses to engage with him. When the man announces that he is here for an argument, the bureaucrat argues the toss with him about whether or not he is here for an argument. Immediately he goes meta. If you've ever been in this kind of argument, you'll know how intense it can get. Going meta is a great way to sneer at someone. You remove the rug from, the, from underneath the other's feet. Their mere immediacy is always false. It's the deep structure, the numinous background, the possibility of the possibility of the horizon of the event of being that is more real or better or just more rhetorically effective than anything else. In this mode, the egg of potentiality comes before the chicken of the actual. Aristotle is invigorating right now precisely because he does think that chickens come before eggs. This mode is exactly what Monty Python exploits, in particular in the argument sketch, but much of their humour is based on this meta-syndrome, which tells us something about how dominant it was in the age of British imperialism, both in its fully erect and collapsing phases. Hyperobjects end the world, and they end the transcendental a priori that jumps out of the world to decide its reality. They do not do so by dint of clever arguments, nor do they do so by remaining mute and impenetrable. There is a rhetorical mode of hyperobjects, since all objects are a form of delivery. Hyperobjects don't just smack us upside the head or kick us like Dr. Johnson's boot, refuting Barclay with a non-argument of an aggressive kick. They are not pre-reflective, if by that we mean some immediate hotline to truth. Indeed, if rhetorical delivery has a name, it would be need to include something like an inducement to reflection. Aristotle's rhetoric is a profoundly original meditation on human affect. Rhetoric is as much the art of listening as it is the art of speaking. But to what are we listening when we attune to the hyperobject? Is this uncertainty not, pre uncertainty not precisely what we are hearing? Isn't it the case that the affect delivered to us in the rain, the weird cyclone, the oil slick, is something uncanny? If it has a name, perhaps it is weirdness or creepiness, perhaps the most telling word is the word doom. <laughs> what is doom? Conventionally, doom is a decree or an ordinance, a directive. Doom is also judgment, law, the faculty of judging, the final judgment that happens after the end of the world, right? Yet doom is also what we deem, opinion, discernment. Doom can mean fate, destiny, and in a stronger sense, death. Finally, doom means justice, or even judge, one who dispenses justice. Justice is a figure that Derrida calls synonymous with deconstruction, in that it is irreducibly futural. Perfect justice can never be achieved now. There is always a remainder to come. 
A good judge doesn't just mechanically dole out arguments, but paradoxically enforces and suspends the law at the same time. Doesn't this rich range of meanings suggest something about the hyperobject? The hyperobject is indeed the bringer of fate, destiny, death. The destiny comes from beyond the human world and pronounces or decrees the end of that world. Their, this decree marks a decisive pivot in Earth history in which humans discern the non-human and thus reckon the fate of Earth with a greater justice. Or, just to go hog-wild, Heidegger style, for a moment, doom comes from doom and doom's doom. This doom marks a decisive moment in which human doom, humans doom the non-human and thus doom the doom of Earth with greater doom. Ba-boom. Each political and ethical decision is made on the inside of a hyperobject caught in the resonance of the zones that spell doom. Even cynicism becomes a kind of hypocrisy in the grinding roar of the hyperobject. Cynicism is in fact the worst kind of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy squared, since cynicism is hypocritical about its hypocrisy. The hypocrite understands that she is caught in her own failure. The cynic still hopes that if he vomits disgustingly enough, things will change. The cynic <laughs> hopes he is not beyond hope. He is a hypocrite. He is trying to escape doom. Humans have entered an era of hypocrisy. I mean this very precisely. In Greek, hypo means under, hidden or secret, while krisis means judgment, determination or discernment. So there is a vivid sense in which we are still exploring the contours of doom when we think about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a secret doom. Convention tells us this means that someone is hiding something, pretending. Hypocrisy is a pretense, an act. But it is also simply hidden doom, a message sent from somewhere else, or a message that is self-secret in some sense, encrypted. Hypocrisy comes from the Greek term for delivery, hypocrisis. An actor is a hypocrite. Remember that one sense of doom is a decree or ordinance, that which is delivered, a statute or statement, a phrase that stands. Delivery is the fifth aspect of traditional rhetoric, right? There is discovery, invention, arrangement, logic, style, memory, and delivery. Delivery is how a speech is embodied, how it is spoken, how it comes to exist for others. Demosthenes was once quizzed about what he thought was the most important part of rhetoric. He replied, delivery. Upon being asked what the second most important part was, he replied, delivery, and so on. Demosthenes practiced his delivery by putting pebbles in his mouth and climbing steep hills while reciting his speeches. Delivery is physical. What if we flip this around so that we could understand that the physical is a form of delivery? Think about it. A CD is delivery. An MP3 is delivery. A vinyl record is delivery. A cassette tape is delivery. Every one has its own physicality. Each one is an object, not some neutral medium, but an entity in its own right. Now, what if the lamp were a form of delivery? The lamp tells my eyes about the light that its diffuser diffuses. The base of the lamp delivers this stem to this um, makeshift uh, desktop here. The fluorescent, no, the other kind of naughty light inside the lamp delivers the dusty photograph to me in such a way that I can see a reflection of my typing hands in the glass in the photo frame. We never hear the wind as such, only the wind in the chimney, the wind in the doorway. The zone of one object crisscrosses with another's in the interobjective configuration space. Things are aeolian, acousmatic. Their timbre, timber, substance, matter, speaks of secret strangers. A thing delivers another thing. Rain, sunburn, plastic bags, car engines deliver the doom of the hyperobject. They are its hypocrites. They lie about the hyperobject. They tell secrets. Why does the rain lie about the hyperobject while telling secrets about it? Things get stranger still when we consider a single object, which is why reckoning hyperobjects as a mode of objective presence is simply out of the question. Let us imagine, for the sake of argument, one single thing alone. I know how hard this is for us to do in an age in which even Chevron 